21 convention 2014 in Tampa and today we have somebody who is a pretty amazing guy I know him personally uh, he's gonna talk to you about self-defense he's gonna talk to you about mindset and the killer instinct he gave a speech in 2012 in Austin Texas on the killer instinct and tapping into your masculine power when it comes to violence intense situations and even transitioning into business and being the better expression of yourself he's a first degree black belt under william vandry he also has trained with paul vunak uh certified jkd instructor the list goes on and on mr ed aiken what's up man hi thank you all right all right so this is my second time at the 21 convention so if you're wondering why there's 22 speakers it's probably my fault i think i strong arm anthony into making me uh, talk today. So anyway, I hope you guys' trip was good as mine. You guys got uh, felt up at the airport like we did. Um, but uh, I always opt out. You guys should opt out. I know some guys are from another country. Where are all guys from? Where, where's, I know someone's from Moscow, Australia. How's the TSA there? Good? They're just, just fine. Well, I bring it up for a reason. Um, we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, extreme violence, and not that uh, the TSA is doing a great job or anything like that, but I represent the TSA and I bring them up because if you think about why they were created in the first place, right, they're created as a system to keep us safe from terrorism. So part of that system is they create some rules and some things of prohibited items that we can no longer take on the airplane, right? And so the, the idea being that we can't use those items as weapons. And so I kind of did an experiment this time, and I didn't bring it down, but uh, I didn't want to show it on camera either, but I went through the uh, security TSA and they allowed me to go on, went through all my stuff, and they let me go on with at least six weapons, right? All of which, in my opinion, are more deadly than box cutters. And these aren't overt weapons, they're everyday items, they're perfectly legal. Um, but I bring that up because, A, we're going to be talking about systems today. And systems in and of themselves, whereas a system of government, of religion, of martial arts, systems are limited, right? And if we think of the truth, no matter what context that is, when it comes to violence or terrorism or the truth of life, uh, it's limitless. And so we can never really, um, we can have systems that help lead us to the truth, but when they represent the truth in and of themselves or claim to, we find out that that's false. But more importantly, there's also another element in this, and, and um, we're going to go back to it, but the, the creative, motivated individual is always going to find a way to utilize systems to his or her advantage, right? To always flip the system or to even circumvent the system. And so we're going to use that because what I'm going to be talking about today, are, uh, the title of my speech are the three reasons why I believe every man needs to train for extreme violence, right? The three reasons why you sitting out there need to train for extreme violence. And I don't want this to kind of be um, like, hey, here's the three reasons why you need to eat more leafy greens, or here's the three reasons why you need to drink more water or do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. What I want to do is give you concepts, and I'm, I'm really big on um, universal concepts and kind of looking at the bigger thing. I think everything obviously is related, but if we can step back enough and be abstract enough, then we can take the concepts, even if they're presented to you in a way of, of dealing with extreme violence, because I believe that's very important, but it's the concepts that you'll be able to plug into other areas of your life. And if you guys can get that, then I'll have done my job, right? Because not everybody's going to go and, and get ready for the zombie apocalypse after this. Some of you guys might, but hopefully you'll be able to, to take some of those key things with us. So with that being said, we have to, what would the first reason be? And we have to identify this because the second reasons, two and three, these are really steps and they're byproducts of answering the first question. Because my idea is that once we set up, once we honestly answer why you as a man need to train for extreme violence, then we have to prepare for it, right? Well, how do you go about doing that? And I'm going to lay out some principles. So even if you don't train in martial arts or you train in different martial arts, you can apply these principles. And so in order to realistically answer that question, well, why should you? It's a pretty basic reason. The first reason is pretty, it's a no-brainer, right? And the first reason is this, it's survival, right? The idea is if you as a man are going to be in an extreme violent situation, right, <clears throat> pretty simple, you want to be able to go home at night and take your body with you, right? Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what, what's the first level is like physiological, 
So I think taking your body home with you is pretty physiological. So that's pretty basic, right? That's a no-brainer. It's like, hey, if, if, uh, some, if you walk out of here today and somebody sticks a gun in your face or somebody attacks you, you want to be able to go home at night. And so this gets to our first concept. And in order to really say, OK, well, well, how? How do we need to prepare for that, right? We have to do the first thing. And this is a great, great thing that most people don't do. They think they do it, but they don't. And we have to analyze reality, right? We got to look at what, what's really happened. How does shit go down in the street? How does thing, how, you know, somebody breaks into your house, how is that scenario likely to unfold, right? And, and what, are, what types of scenarios do you as a man walking around in the world do you have a chance of getting into, getting involved with? Even if you're trying to avoid it, sometimes bad things happen, right? And so we have to analyze reality. We don't want to guess or pontificate as to what we think is going to happen or what somebody told us is going to happen. We have to investigate reality. And what we find is that when bad things occur, when extreme violence occurs, it can happen in any number of ways. It's, it's, you know, so, so we kind of are at a quandary. We're kind of at a, at a roadblock because how do you prepare for the unexpected? Right? How do you prepare for something that can unfold in an infinite number of ways? Right? So, we're going to get there, and I'm going to give you a set of principles. We're not going to get a system, but we're going to give you a set of principles and concepts of how to break that down and how to look at things differently. And this concept right here can easily transfer over into other areas, right? How many of the best um, marketers do, what do they do? They analyze markets. They see what the market wants, but how many companies create products or somebody has a great idea for a product, they create the product, they put a bunch of time and effort and marketing into it, they release it, and nobody buys it because they didn't analyze reality. So even though it's a pretty simple concept, how many people actually follow it? And if we're talking about the seriousness of surviving something really bad happening, then we've got to start with analyzing reality. So how do we do that? Well, when it comes to violence, we, have, we live in the information age, so we have hundreds of thousands of hours of actual fights that we can go watch, right? We now have video of um, cage matches, where we actually get to see what techniques work and what don't in a pressure situation. We get actual violent crimes. We can see mass attacks, the knockout game. We can see flash mobs. We can see rioting. Not that you want to look at all that stuff, but you want to be prepared to see how different elements and, and things come together when it comes to violence. Because that's the first thing, is we analyze reality, but we don't want to stop there. We have to use reality as our feedback. Right? And that's the second concept, really. We're still on the first reason, but we're, we're going to, and I'm going to spend more time on this survival setup because what I'm doing is giving you a framework of training. And it's through the training that's actually going to change you physiologically. Right? It's not, you're not going to be buff or, or all this stuff. It, you will if you do certain strength training. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your filters and the way you walk through the world and you carry yourself. Right? It will change you. But we need to use reality as your feedback mechanism, right? Extremely important, especially when we're dealing with violence, because <clears throat> people get caught in their paradigms, and people get caught in systems and their stylized way of being, right? This is, a lot of the concepts I'm giving you come directly from Bruce Lee. He was a, he was a pioneer and a master and a philosopher. But using reality as a feedback, a lot of people will, will get caught in their paradigms because they also need to have a proper outlook and a proper approach to deal with their context. And our context is extreme violence. So what do I mean by that? OK, well, we have a good idea of how violence can unfold, and it can unfold in any number of ways. right? So now we can say, OK, well, let's look at reality, and let's look at some solutions. So some of the solutions are, well, let's look at cage fighters. Those guys are pretty tough. right? So we look at MMA. And, and um, there was a fight in Vegas not that long ago, like just this last month. And a fighter, uh, after his fight, went out to the bars in, in uh, Vegas. And he ended up getting an altercation. Now, he was a smaller guy. I think he fights at 155. Um, but he ended up getting in a fight with this big dude. And just as he was telling the guy, he was saying, Google me, bitch. I'm a fighter. The guy clocked him right, and hit him hard. Now, to his, you know, he's a trained fighter. He's a really tough guy. So he took the punch. right? And what did he do? Well, he did a pretty, pretty smart thing as he went for a double leg because if you know anything about jujitsu or if he has superior grappling, you get the guy on the ground, you can beat a bigger opponent. Not that you can't beat them standing. But what happened was he was in a bar, 
and there were multiple people there. And so when he went for his takedown, somebody else jumped in and grabbed him, pulled him off, and then a bunch of people got into the fray, right? Luckily, it got broken up, but he's even more lucky that the guy's friends didn't have a gun, a knife, hit him in the head with a chair. So this is where we, we, we can run and we go, okay, let's look at this. And there's really two camps when it comes to violence. There's, um, there's the guys really doing it in the proven combat martial arts, and then there's self-defense and traditional martial artists, right? And so the traditional martial artists are the self-defense expert who deals with weapons, who deals with multiple opponents, who can do 50,000 neck-breaking moves, will look at that fight and go, yeah, see, MMA is bullshit. It's a controlled environment, right? Yeah, those guys are tough, but um, they're, they're on a soft uh, surface. They're not on concrete. There aren't, uh, you know, they're not striking vital organs and vital, you know, going to the eyes. They can't hit the groin and do all the stuff that we can do. So they'll discount MMA and they'll go, okay, it's bullshit. Meanwhile, the MMA guy is over here and he's listening to this dude and he's like, all right, dude, let's go prove it, right? Let's go fight right now. And if they end up fighting, provided there's no weapons, the MMA guy's gonna dust him with a basic jab, cross hook, and leg kick most of the time. But remember, there's no superior styles or martial arts. There are superior training methods and superior individuals, right? So there may be an individual over here who can take them out. But we're, we're, what we need to do, if we were to answer this question and we were to survive, we have to get the best of both words, worlds. We have to look at this and go, no, it's not that MMA has a superior training method when it comes to certain things, when it comes to one-on-one -on -one fighting, right? They're pressure testing, they're in the cage, they're getting punched, they're seeing what works, they're learning what works and what doesn't, they're getting taken down. This guy is doing more training and he's covering more areas, but his training method is lacking because he's not sparring. Right? Sparring is, is when you get to really um, find out if, if your stuff is worth it. Right? If you don't, but that's the framework. If we can have a good framework of, of good functional training methods, then we can add the other stuff on top of it. See what I'm saying? So what this does is now we get into, we got to have a concept of how to approach systems. Right? And I'm gonna get back to this because this is really important. Remember, these are universal concepts that I'm giving you. This doesn't just have to apply with violence. And I, I really want you guys to think about systems because <clears throat> we, we wanna have an approach. And before we can have an approach, we, we need to have an approach of how to break down violence, right? Because we have this thing that's basically, and this is a way to look at anything that seems really complex. But we have this thing that can happen in any number of ways, right? And so we need a way to look at that and to break it down into different parts, moving parts albeit, but we have to have a way to understand it so we can structure our training and utilize the right systems and right parts of the systems that we need. And so the first thing we could do, and this Bruce Lee was a was master at martial arts. He was a master at looking at um, breaking down different martial arts and in a time when people were stuck in styles and systems, he was looking at the fight as, as this all-encompassing thing where anything can happen. And what he said was, well, a fight can happen in any number of ranges. So he began to break fighting down into a kicking range, which is your longest range because your legs longer than your arms, boxing range, trapping range, which is in close, and then grappling range, which is like a combination of throws, clinching, and, and groundwork. And so we can start breaking things down, breaking violence down, into different ranges, right? Because we don't wanna just stop with the empty hands fight, we wanna stop, we wanna to get to the extreme violent uh, outcome, right? We wanna prepare for that. So if we look at violence, how can things happen in the street? What's the longest range? Well, the longest range would be a long rifle. If somebody popped in here with an AK-47, that would be the longest range, right? For, for chance of survival, probably not very good, but that's the longest range. Then of course we go to medium guns and short guns and handguns, and it can be a long range, but you can have a gunfight in close, right? So then we can look at our other weapons, or um, uh, we can go to projectile weapons. Somebody can come in here and throw a hatchet or a chainsaw or a squirrel. Where's, it? Where's Brian? Yeah, see, so you have squirrels flying. It's a story for another time. But uh, it can happen. You gotta be prepared for anything, right? I'm prepared for that big pod in the Halo games to come down, the guy jumps out, and you gotta, you gotta be ready to go with it. But uh, it's true, it's a mindset. And so, uh, uh, you know, we look at ranges and then we break that down into weapons ranges. We have long weapons, right? Staffs, chairs, boards. Um, we've got um, uh, blunt, edge, blunt weapons, sticks. We've got knives, long swords, short knives, right? So we're breaking it down into the different uh, ranges and of course our ground fighting, all that stuff. But then we have to, we can't be done there, right? Because we saw that 
the range is, um, in the MMA fight that guy had in the bar, that wasn't a bad tactic, but it was a bad tactic because the elements were different, right? There were multiple opponents. So we break it down in the ranges and elements, right? And so the elements can be what? Can be um, there's two guys, three guys, 10 guys, um, a bunch of onlookers, some kids, your wife. Um, we've got the types of weapons. We can kind of bring them down. Two guys had a knife, one guy had a stick, and another guy was just ugly. So we just, you know, we've got the elements, but one more thing is we've got environment, right? The environment can change your tactics, right? Because we want to get to a point where we're able to spontaneously adapt to what is, right? And the what is can take many forms, but if we have these principles to kind of guide us, then, then we, we have, it's a way to kind of chunk large bits of information, right? But our environment, you can be in close, you can have tables and chairs, the, the um, surface could be wet, you could have broken bottles on the surface, you could have a lot of room to move, right? You can be in a jail cell, you don't know, you might be in a church. It could be any number of things, and we have to be able to adapt with our ranges, our elements, and our environment. And so this gets us back to systems. Now we have a way to kind of break violence down, right? And, and you can do that if you train in the martial arts and you start looking at the specific style that you're training in, look at where it's limited, right? Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is great for what? Ground fighting, right? There's, there's a few things standing up and they do train against the other ranges, but for all intents and purposes, it's a ground fighting art. Right? They don't, I, the last time I was in jiu-jitsu, we did not wrestle with a knife. Right? Some places do, but that's where you can start to look and say, okay, where, where is my system? Where is my, um, what I'm relying on, where is it limited? And you start filling in the holes with those things, those other systems that work. Right? But we need a philosophy. And this is where, this is really important. <clears throat> So what we want to do is we want to be able to absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, and add specifically what is our own, right? And what that means is we basically look at the system, look at all the elements, look at the ranges of what we're preparing for, and we say, okay, in this particular scenario, um, we're going to take this, uh, uh, these particular techniques, these work, these don't, throw those out. But then we want to add specifically what is our own, right? Because Bruce uh, believed that the individual was more important than any system or styles. I think we can all agree on that, right? The individual, the living, creating individual is more important than system or style. So you don't want to have to change yourself to be uh, a part of a system, right? That system should be flexible enough to change to suit you. And if it's not, you throw it out, right? If you're a 300 pound man with limited flexibility, you're probably not going to be doing jump spinning kicks in a fight right? Doesn't mean you throw out kicking altogether, but you might, might pick one or two kicks and then have to change the way you throw them based on your body type, right? So you're, you're, you're create, getting those things that are effective, throwing those things out, but you're, you're um, now honoring your expression of who you are. And so this is very important when it comes to life, is it not? Like how many times do we not do that? How many times do we try to fit in? How many times do we, we stifle our expression because of a system or something that other people are, are saying that this is the way, right? So this is very important. I'm going to share a story of how this, um, uh, this philosophy uh, is universal. Has anyone ever heard of um, the gambler Don Johnson? Not the actor, but the gambler. He's one of the most famous uh, high rollers in Vegas. Anybody ever heard of that guy? Yeah. There's a documentary out, it's pretty short. I forget what it's called. Anyway, this guy used this to a T. And what he did is he analyzed casinos for weaknesses, right? He looked at the systems of the casinos and he analyzed them for weaknesses. And what he did is he identified the best game that would um, uh, give him uh, the best chance to make money. And if you know anything about casinos, it's all statistical and it's always in the, in the house's favor, right? That's how they exist. And what he was able to do is take their entire perk system along with um, everything else that makes the casino money in conjunction with the rules of blackjack. And he identified all the rules that he needed um, to make this thing work for him. So he absorbed what is useful. He said, I'm going to keep all these. Then what he did is he went through all the rules and identified the ones that he needed to get rid of, right? And he did it at a time where the casinos took a dive and they were courting him. They really wanted his business because they thought that they could get millions from this guy. So he said, okay, I'll come play at your casino, but you got to take out these rules. I want to do this, this, and this instead, 
right? Because what he did, once he, once he absorbed what is useful and he rejected what is useless, he got rid of those rules that, that weren't there. He calculated the, um, the chance, right? He calculated the advantage. And he got it all the way down to like 0 0.0025, still in favor of the house, right? That's not enough. You know anything about, that's all the house needs to still get money from you if you play over a period of time. Doesn't mean you can't win in, in different settings, but statistically, if you play over a uh, um, good amount of time, you're gonna lose your money. So what he did is he then added specifically what is his own. And he said, okay, well, I want this rule. I want a surrender rule where all I need to do is do that with my finger and I can surrender half of my bet. It's an insurance bet. And if the dealer doesn't see it, then I get to have a free hand. I basically get to play with your money. And they agreed to it. And that tipped it back into his favor. Because that was an element where he, he was very smart. What he did is he hired a bunch of adult film stars to sit with him when he played to distract the dealers, and he was able to swing the bet more into, into, his, uh, uh, into his realm. And what happened was over a period of, I don't know, three or four different uh, sessions with different casinos, he won $15 million before they ever, ever pulled the plug on him. Because he was, he was going with a system that he created but he, he did it in a way that worked for him. And he, he didn't do anything illegal. The casinos agreed to this. He simply tipped it into his favor. And that's the type of thinking that I wanna, wanna get to you that you can get out of this. These are universal things. So we get to this and now we have to get to our training. We're still on the first reason. We still need to survive. And so what types of training do we do? Well, we know that we have um, different systems and they have ways of, of training that we wanna take. But also we need to add a couple other things. I'll just do it up here because I don't see a, uh, a washer. Oh, yeah. We're still on survival, but this is what we need. We need to do uh, scenarios. We need to have spontaneous scenario sessions, right? In other words, we're gonna do something where we set up a training session and we don't really know what's gonna happen. And maybe the opponents know where we have one person approach us and they're gonna talk and then the next, uh, next thing we know we're getting attacked from the side. And then we go through these different scenarios. If you fall on the ground, maybe somebody throws in a knife and you're flowing from scenario to scenario, right? Because we have to cultivate spontaneity. We have to have responsibility. We have to be able to respond to what is. And see, through this training, being, having different scenarios, you're never going to know how you're going to respond unless you do it in a way that's unexpected, right? Isn't life like that? Like it's, you think you know, and then it happens, and you responded in a totally different way, right? This happens probably with pickup. You go, you know, you got all the lines, you do everything. The first time you go to talk to a girl, you, you follow up, right? It's just, that's the way it is. Because the scenarios, we've got to do another thing. We've got to, we've got to train different scenarios because you want to flow from range to range and art to art without getting stuck anywhere, right? You, would, you even need to make mistakes and recover from your mistakes. So we have to do scenario training, but then we have to pressure test everything. You've got to pressure test everything. Because if you don't, once again, you're get, you might get caught in a paradigm. You might get caught in a system, or in, a, in a system of false belief. You can do uh, a million different disarms and have some really good training methods to deal with the knife and taking a knife away. And in fact, there's a lot of knife arts that are, are highly evolved and you see the top guys and they're moving really fast, taking knives away like that. And you can get to a high level, but a lot of times they don't add pressure. And what pressure is, is getting a guy who's going to really stab you. He's not going to go along with you. You don't know what angle it's coming at, and he's just going to come at you with intent and pressure. And you have to try that disarm. And if it doesn't work, what do we do? We throw it out. But it becomes a process of self-discovery, right? So we're constantly running into the cause of our own ignorance, right? You're constantly refining that which doesn't work and throwing it out. And you probably are going to get down to the one or two things that work best for you. And you'll find that in certain scenarios, in certain environments, what you thought worked before doesn't work and you have to change it out, right? But it's the thinking and being able to change yourself on the fly that's changing you, right? The ability to change your thinking on the fly is what changes you, right? Because we're pressure testing. We're moving from everything. We have to do one more thing. We have to get aliveness in our drills. You still need to drill your techniques and your basics, right? But we want to do it in a way that's alive. And what we mean by that is we want to add movement, 
right? If you're just working your jab, cross, and hook, and you're just standing still, that's not realistic, right? We have to work out a movement. So we want our partner, if they're holding pads, to move. And what this does physiologically is you're training your visual cortex. You're training your spatial relationship, right? And, and this whole thing, um, training in this way, no matter what the, the style or particular scenario is, teaches you um, and forces you to change your focus, right? It keeps you in the present moment. I'm sorry. So we're, by going through this type of training, all of a sudden, you're forced to be present. Because if your mind slips in a, a, any moment when you're with a partner, training partner, they're going to punch you in the face. So you get immediate feedback. And it forces you to train your focus to be in the present moment, right? Because I was saying that they're, they're, the past and the future don't exist. They're mental concepts. Because you can only experience the past, and you can only experience the future in your mind, right? It's not to say that the past and the future don't exist. But if you look at the truth of the way of things, everything is one continual present moment, is it not? It's just constantly changing. It might have the illusion of, of being still, but if we break things down, we know that everything's constantly changing. And so by training in this way, you're training your focus to be more in the present moment. And as society, the way it's structured now, all of us are split when we're going from the phone to this screen to this screen. And it does something to your attention. We are finding it harder and harder to be present. And my contention is that the longer you train, because it's not a, it's not a state you can train. Nobody can be in the present moment all the time. Right? We have to think, and we think about things in the past and in the future. But if we train it, we'll find that we are actually have our focus in the present moment more often. Right? So we have the present moment, and we have our uh, response ability. So now, right? So now we are uh, increasing our responsibility, and there's an inverse relationship to this. So this just means that there's external stimuli, something changes, we adapt, right? You move like an echo, you respond like an echo, it moves, you move, whatever that song is, right? You respond, you're increasing your response ability. And this has an inverse relationship to what um, in gun training, which originally came from uh, fighter pilot training, is your OODA loop or OODA loop, right? O-O-D-A, it's an acronym. So it's observe, orient, decide, act. You observe the threat, you orient yourself to it, you decide and you act. And we're decreasing this and we're increasing our responsibility. And what I believe is that we're getting more out of our left brain, uh, if you want to use that model, we're getting more into your right brain. And that kills your internal dialogue. It kills the critical mind, which kills your response ability, right? How many of us get caught in analysis paralysis and then the opportunity passes us by, right? Everybody, everybody. That's a function of getting stuck in your left brain and looking at all the different possibilities instead of just making a move. Even if that move's a mistake, now you have a feedback and you move off that, right? So we're getting into the right brain. So all of this, <clears throat> we get to our reason too. And I've experienced, I experience this constantly, not constantly, but I experience it in direct proportion with the amount of tr uh, training that I'm doing in this particular manner, which I've laid out for you. Because I go through periods where I'll just do my jujitsu and I'll just work my striking and it's not the same. Because although there is spontaneity in it, it's not flowing and the pressure isn't there. It's not from, from scenario to scenario, so the focus is different. Right? You might be isolated and using more body focus rather than your focus out there. But you get in the zone, what I call the flow state, more often. Right? And everybody in this room, I would suggest, has been in the zone in something. Right? You're like, man, I was in the zone. It could be a video game. It could be uh, picking chicks up. It could be at work, at a business presentation. But you're in the zone. And there's a certain phenomena of certain, certain, because it's going to be different depending on your context, right? Being in the zone in a business meeting is different than being in the zone in a street fight, right? But being in the zone, there's a good book called Flow. Um, it's on flow psychology. It's been around for years, but that's a good book to pick up. And there's a certain characteristics in this. And what we find is that we've already talked about it. 
but you're uniquely in the present moment. The past and the future are of no consequence. You are at one with what is. You're at one with the activity, right? Surfers say this all the time. They're at one, they're in, they're, they're in the zen, right? They're in the zone, they've got zen, they're at one with the waves and everything. And that's because you're in the present moment. Your focus is on the activity and you're involved with the activity. And I have a saying, I have a saying that how you do anything is how you do everything. How you tie your shoe is how you uh, uh, fight, right? If you're abstract enough to think it, how you express yourself as you tie your shoe is similar in some way to how you actually fight, is similar to how you go get groceries, right? Because you are constantly expressing who and what you are about at all times. You cannot not communicate, right? You can sit there and not say anything, but you're still communicating and expressing yourself. And if you're abstract enough to kind of see what, um, uh, you know, what the correlations is, then you, by changing one area of your life, you change the others, right? And, and what we find is that we find ourselves in the zone more often. You're in the present moment. You're responding like an echo. I had this experience in the club once. I was just picking chicks up left and right, and I said the exact right thing that they needed to hear, to hear at, at every time every turn. It doesn't happen all the time, right? I'm married now, but I was in the zone. I was flowing. But it's that ability to recognize what they need, what, what the situation needs, and give it to it, right? You're responding like an echo. But this is the biggest thing. <clears throat> this is the biggest thing. There is no fear. For some reason, we live in a fearful society. I don't particularly think I'm a fearful guy. Sometimes I don't like to fly and I don't like heights. But I believe, and I never notice, I don't walk around afraid too often. There are some people that walk and carry more fear. But I believe we have a fear programming society. There's a lot of fear that's artificially programmed into us. And you don't even notice it. But you do notice it when it goes away. Because you're all of a sudden, you're taking, accepting challenges, and I don't mean fights, but you're accepting challenges and taking care of problems because the fear is no longer, you don't fear the consequences. It's not there, and you can feel it. It feels like a drug. Like, you feel you could jump off a building. You're not going to do that, but you're not afraid of it. You're, there is no fear, and, th and that is the biggest thing. And this is where we get to reason three, and this is kind of strange. <clears throat> After time... We're training, right? We're, we're training. We're, we have a pretty good reason for training. We want to survive. We don't want to be a victim of violence. And so we structure our training that way. And through the training, it changes us. And you find yourself in the zone more often in more areas of your life. After a while, my contention is that those changes get locked into your identity, right? And now all of a sudden, this is the third reason, it's like somebody switches you on. You've reached a new level of the game, right? I call it the actualization of your intent. Or you could all call it the actualization of being a man because it does awaken certain primal instincts within you, right? But your actualization of your intent. Now you're walking through the world more in the present moment. You're more in line with what is, right? Because you're used to responding. Your, your, your focus is different and you're, what you find is, uh, the first thing you'll notice, and in my experience I noticed this, you start influencing people in advance simply with your intent, right? This isn't persuasion, but you're influencing people in advance just by showing up, right? And it's almost as if you show up, the door opens, right, as you get to the door. And sometimes there's a hot chick there and she baked you a pie and you get other goodies with it. But it's, it, you, you influence people in advance simply by showing up. Right? It's a kind of a weird thing, and I'll, I'll kind of explain why I think that happens. Um, I mentioned it before, but you cannot not communicate. And people, the way we're designed, are subconsciously picking up everything around us. And we're assimilating a, a tremendous amount of information. So you are aware of everything that the person next to you is about. Not consciously, but we are constantly broadcasting everything we are about. Who we are, what we've done, all of that. And you're picking it up on some level. And when you start making these changes, what happens when you're, when you're switched on, by the fact that you're, you're spontaneous, you're responding, you start solving more problems, right? 
In other words, you're at the business meeting, your, your manager's like, you know, he's always got something that he needs somebody to take care of and you just pass on it because you don't want, it, want the extra work, right? And that's really a fear-based response because you're fearing missing out on something else. Well, suddenly you just start, the, that when that fear's gone, you just start solving problems, which creates more opportunities in your life, right? So you just automatically solve, and when you solve people's problems, and, and they unconsciously pick up on it, they start looking to you to solve problems. And the more problems you solve for more people, there seems to be a mechanism at work that you get more opportunity and good things to happen for you, right? That's, and that's the truth. But you solve problems, and by, by default, you become a leader, right? It's, it's, once again, it's not something where you're like, I'm going to lead you guys, or you're just, you know, um, but because by default that you're a, a problem solver, people will put you on that pedestal, right? And don't the best leaders solve problems? High-powered CEOs, they walk into a place, they have no fear, and they turn companies around, right? They're the go-to guy. And through this training, I've experienced it, it's a direct correlation with training in a specific way because you're training your focus, you're now carrying yourself differently. People unconsciously notice that and they just treat you that way. And so you're influencing people simply by showing up. It's a weird thing, and it is. If you stop training, you can go back and it doesn't happen as often. But you're a leader, and this is the weirdest thing. And I debated about bringing it up, but I don't care. What I find is that when you're switched on, you have this thing called synchronicities happening more often. And I'm gonna share a story about that. But synchronicities, I believe, are a function of, of you functioning at a higher level, right? And they've done studies, basically all a synchronicity is, if you were to calculate the probability of an, that event happening in that particular way, there's no way it could happen. It just, it's like, Events outside of yourself have coincided and, and there is no physical way, you know, you think of somebody you haven't thought about in 10 years and they call you at that instant. Everybody's had that in some, some form. But synchronicities go a little bit beyond that and I'll explain um, what I believe happens. But I had a, uh, I was in Vegas with a, uh, a friend of mine and she was in real estate, this was years ago, and I had an idea for um, a company called, um, that I was gonna market to e-loans. It was a valuation online uh, company. And um, I was gonna market specifically to e-loans. And so on our way back from a hotel, we were on the side street, we were driving back to LA. I told her and pitched her my idea because I wanted her feedback, right? She was also in real estate. So we had a 10 minute long conversation about this company. And as we're pulling onto the freeway, this car was already on the freeway and it pulls in front of us and it's vanity license plate from California. The one and only person who owns this license plate said e-loan on it, right? And we both, and I, I share this because I have a witness, and we both went, that's, you know, that's beyond coincidental. That is, that's pretty crazy. But I have a theory about that. There was a study in Cornell, and what they found is um, they found that a certain percentage of people perceive uh, in the future, albeit a couple seconds, right? They've done, they've done a replicable study that, that people have, um, have duplicated. And what they found is they, they got different control groups, and I believe they did uh, nine tests, and eight of the nine showed that um, they flashed them different images. And some of the images were erotic and emotionally laden, right? And they were random, randomly generated, and they tested people's physiology, their, their physiological responses. And what they found is that a large number, more than what should have been expected, started to respond before the erotic images two to three seconds before even the computer selected those images. Right? So what if, as a, a side effect of me training, for some reason my mind perceived a little bit further in the future, saw a flash of Elon, which, which prompted me to have that whole conversation ending with the thing that triggered it in the first place. Right? So I'm not saying there isn't a, a logical explanation to this, but I do believe that through the training it changes you uh, physiologically. And you may or may not experience this, but I have, and, and many, many times. And I believe that that's, that's part of the mechanism. But um, I, wanna, I wanna end with a story actually, uh, which I believe is, is, is perfect for the actualization of being a man. And um, it's, a, it's a good example, because I do believe in our recent past that men were different just by the, the fact of how society was, right? My grandfather is a farmer, so he was used to getting his hands. We didn't have all the distractions. Life wasn't as hectic, right? We didn't have all those distractions. But my grandfather, he grew up in Nazi Germany. He died before I was born, I never met him. And when he was a kid, uh, during World War I, he was playing in a tavern, 
and he wasn't supposed to be there at night, and some soldiers brought some of the locals down into the basement where he was playing, so he had to hide. And as he was hiding, uh, right in front of him, they proceeded to, to torture these guys and cut their tongues out, right, as a, as a sign for them not to, for the town not to talk. So imagine being a kid a few feet away from this horrific thing, and on top of that, having to be quiet so that you're, 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 or you're gonna get discovered and probably get your tongue cut out, right? I can't imagine that. Well, years later, uh, in World War II, my, my grandfather was um, older. He, uh, he recognized what was happening when Hitler was coming to power. So he grabbed my grandmother, he grabbed um, some family friends and some other family members, they fled to Mexico, right? And while he was in Mexico, um, he, he started a farm there. Some, uh, he employed a bunch of the locals to work the land, right? And one day the banditos came into his farm, right? And they started beating up his workers and extorting money from them. So um, the story goes there was about a dozen of them and he, he went out, he grabbed a hoe. It wasn't my grandmother, but he grabbed a hoe, right? <laughs> she, she, was, she was pleading with him not to do this, but he said, no, I have to go out there. It's my duty, these are my men. He went out there and whatever transpired, right? He made such an impression on them, I dare say, with his intent, right, to put himself in harm's way, he went out there and not only backed them all down, they returned the money and they never came back, right? And I thought, oh, man, what an amazing person. And if that's not enough of a testament to, to the character of being a man, right, shortly after that, he, uh, uh, he and his workers were carrying, like, um, they had a cart, but they were carrying it on their back, and it had wheels. And they had, I don't know if it was fertilizer or what, but it was probably between 600 and 1,000 pounds. It took six men to move this. Well, while they were moving it, the wheels broke, right? So my grandfather held up the, um, this uh, 600 to 1,000 pounds by himself so everybody could get out safely, breaking his back in the process. And I was like... You know, holy shit, I would have just dropped it and ran. But, you know, I, to this day, I'm, I'm upset that I never got to meet the man. But I'm like, wow, what an amazing human being. And, but something about those stories always bothered me, right? Uh, and, and something about me is like, I want to I wanna understand things. I want to understand how people understand. And something about those stories always bothered me. And I thought to myself, well, you know, how different would the world have been if men like my grandfather and other men, like my grandfather, stood up to Hitler and they didn't, they didn't flee, right? Would World War II would have stopped? Because obviously my grandfather wasn't afraid of adversity. He'd stand up to 12 guys, probably not the best thing for a street fight, right? But he fled when Hitler was coming to power. And so I always pondered that and I thought, man, what, you know, why would he do that? And so one day I was uh, jogging, this is a true story. I was jogging in Manhattan Beach and um, uh, you get in kind of meditative state sometimes when you're running, and this voice popped in my head. And it wasn't like I was hearing voices, right? I know the difference, but it was a thought. And this voice said to me, and it said, if you happen upon an injustice or a problem in your immediate world, right? If you happen upon an injustice in your immediate world and you're strong enough to handle it or you're strong enough to take care of it, it's your responsibility, Right? And I thought, man, that's a pretty profound concept. How often, how different would the world be if men just stood up to the plate and took care of shit as it happened, right? How different would your world be, even if it's just a little problem? But think about governments, as corruption wouldn't be able to exist, right? So, and the voice went on and said this, if you're, if you're, you know, if there's an injustice in your immediate world and you're strong enough to handle it, it's your responsibility. If you're not, it's not. If you're not strong enough, it's not your responsibility. So my grandfather, as a child, uh, he couldn't do anything to stop those men, right? He was strong enough to not, not speak out and let it affect him adversely later on. But, <clears throat> you know, one thing about trauma in children is that it'll happen, it, they'll either become victimized their entire life or it'll strengthen their character. And so I believe that my, my grandfather's character was strengthened. And so this voice said, you know, realistically, what would, what would he have done in, in um, uh, Nazi Germany? What could he have done? He was a farmer. He was a simple man. So really, he probably would have got himself killed, he said. But, um, and it concluded with this. And remember, this is just a thought. These are probably my thoughts. But it concluded with this. And it said, and don't let the fact that although some things might seem too much, be too much for you to handle, don't let that stop you from doing amazing things because you're certainly stronger than you think you are even in times when your body tells you you're not, right? 
So think about that, guys. I think uh, that's about our time, or we can do some Q&A. Guys, do we have any questions? One second here. You can read it. This, this is pertaining to uh, what, what you talked about, martial arts and throwing out techniques that you think don't work. Yep. So it says, when certain techniques don't work in a pressure scenario, sometimes isn't it worth it to tweak the technique yeah. rather than throw it out? Yeah, don't throw it out before you know it doesn't run to work, you know, before you, you come to that. Anytime you come to a conclusion, you, you're deleting something. And so you have, to, uh, you have to uncover the cause of your own ignorance. And oftentimes people will throw things out before they really work them. So you really have to, it's a process of discovery. You have to figure out when you're throwing things out too soon or when you're sticking with them too long, right? And that's, that's very difficult to do. It's a discernment and it's something that you'll get from your experience. But um, it's, it's also a very, it's human nature to do that. A lot of times we'll stick with things just out of stubbornness because we want to do it or because we see no other solution. Whereas other times we don't stick with it long enough. Right? There's, I always see that meme of the, the guy that's chipping away and he's di building a tunnel and then he turns around right when there's, there's all these diamonds you know, a few inches away. Right? But sometimes, you know, it, when, it, when it comes to being spontaneous and creating more action, it's sometimes better to just drop it and, and come back to it later and do something else. Right? In, in LP, what do they say? They're like, if what you're doing isn't working, do anything else. So depending on the context, you know, um, be careful not to throw things out too soon, but at the same time, if you're in the shit and, you, and it ain't working, change it, do something else, come back to it later on. And that's a, that's a good philosophy for jujitsu. I know there's some guys that, that train. Okay, so. there's three more questions here. How do you choose slash identify a good coach for martial arts? What makes them a good coach? Well, uh, once again, it's, um, that depends on you. All, we're all individuals, and you can have the best coach in the world, but he could have the personality of a diet crouton, right? And, and if he doesn't jive with you, that's your first thing. If you feel uncomfortable around somebody, um, you know, that's good. But also, one of the things you can do is, is look at them. If, you, if their training method, if it, in, in, if it has the pressure testing, right, if they're spontaneous, if they drill, if he, if he has an eye for reality, and also if the coach himself is, um, he's not just there to teach classes, he's there to help you progress, right? That's, that can be a rare thing, because sometimes guys are just clocking the clock, right? They're just clocking in, but you want to find somebody who is genuine, who, who um, and look at his students, look at his senior students. If those guys are good in their particular area, because you may, maybe you'll just go to somebody for boxing. If you look at his students and they've got skill, then he's a good technical trainer. And then the rest of it is personality, right? And that's something that you have to decide. Because I've done this and I've spent years and years with people who um, uh, are not the best to be around for other areas of your life. But as long as you're clear on that, uh, there's no problem with going with somebody just for their technical skill. But once again, it depends on what, you're, you know, what areas are you trying to shore up and how good is that guy in that area. In my opinion, you want experts in each area. I seek out the top guys for everything, right? And it doesn't matter if it's martial arts. You want the best guys. So, um, you know, over time, you'll get the education. I can look at somebody and see if they're good. I mean, I've got to see them move or, or do something, but within a short time, I can tell if, they're, if they know their stuff or not. Okay, one, uh, well, two more questions here. How do you spar without getting punched in the head so much you lose IQ number, points? Number how do you one, avoid injury? Yeah, number one, don't ask Steve. He is not, does not know how not to get hit and punched in the face. Um, it's, uh, you can spar with pressure without getting in the kitchen and, and being rock'em, sock'em robots, right? You don't have to put on the headgear, but it requires good training partners. And there'll be some contact, but you kind of have, um, in certain ranges, when you're close and you're throwing an elbow, you're simulating the elbow, you're not really gonna throw it. And the same thing with the punches, you, you'll, somebody's gotta have a certain level of skill so they don't really knock you out. Right? And if you're going to go that route, because you do need to experience that at some point, you will never know how you're going to react to a punch until you get punched. I don't care. I don't care what you say or what you think. If you've never been punched, you don't know how you're going to react. Everybody reacts differently, albeit similarly in, in different ways. So um, 
you know, th those are some of the few things, but how do you train, you can, you know, improve, there are drills to improve your head movement and get somebody who has boxing gloves and start slow, do it out of movement, move your head and, and, and you'll start seeing things. Sometimes a student's problem is they're not, their they're, uh, line familiarization, their visual acuity isn't in tune. And so you have to uh, do attribute training, do weapons training to get them to start seeing different lines of attack, right? And sometimes the training method doesn't train lines of attack. Like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu doesn't train, uh, isn't going to attack you with all this crazy stuff standing up. So you're never going to develop that visual acuity. And, that, and that's part of the attribute training. Okay, this last question is actually a combination of two. But one said, how do you increase your in the zone moments? And the combination is, so I'm artfully doing, is what is it about violence or sex or extreme situation that taps us into that flow state? Uh, first question was, um, how do you get in the zone more often? Ecstasy. Yep. That's right, very good. That's it, yeah. No, it's training. The, you gotta do the training methods with, um, you gotta be in situations that force you to be spontaneous, that put you in the pressure, um, and, and you're, uh, that have a liveness. You have to have a lot of movement and spatial relationship. Right, because it's the training, the focus. It's being able to see and move and respond to all the different stimuli in your environment, and that requires being present, uh, presently focused. So a lot of sparring, a lot of um, knife sparring, stick sparring, um, sparring on the ground, movement drills where you're, you're, you know, your opponent moves and you're just maintaining a certain distance. Anything with movement. And, and it also, you can get into a very good meditative state while you're training. It's, uh, we call it, you know, thinking without thinking. You, there is no thought, and you will notice it. There is no internal dialogue. And, um, and the last part, was what is about extreme sex and violence? Those are primal drivers, right? We are, we are programmed as men to go out and procreate and continue the species, right? And part of that is once you get a band, once you get your tribe, you're going to have to protect it against other men because we want to be the top dog biologically, right? So, so fighting and fucking are tapping into this very similar types of primal instincts that are, are in us biologically, in my opinion, right? And so we're, we're tapping into these primal drivers. Like we probably have a, a species memory of just, you know, fighting for your life on the battlefield. And, and or fighting off tigers and it's ingrained in you. And what I do suggest is that once you get actualized, these drivers become activated as well. And so you'll feel more confident as you walk through the world, right? Because I'm not, I'm not big, I'm a tough guy, but sometimes I feel like you know, my balls are this big just because of the feeling. And I don't really know where it comes from, but I, I suspect that it's, it's something that's ingrained in us and we kind of turn it on. You know, and some people have it more naturally. And also, I think it's being purposely shut down in, in men, you know, through, through all sorts of mechanisms. So we got to fight to get it back. And it doesn't mean you have to be the alpha male and be all this, but you, want, you don't want to negate that side of yourself. You don't want it to overpower you. Be as much in touch with your feminine side as your masculine side and balance the two. But if you're short on the range in any one area, there's some guys who have never been in a violent uh, angry rage and there's some guys who are always in a violent angry rage and you need to have that balance but you'll have the behavioral flexibility through through doing this type of expression because also with this training goes back to my first talk you have you're forced to turn the killer instinct on and off that means you're channeling your emotions all of your intent all of your fear your anger goes right into killing your opponent and you have to have that commitment but then shut it off because the moment your past doesn't work you've got to go back to, to, okay, I've got to change my focus because I watch out for multiple opponents. But when you decide to make your entry, your, your killing shots, you go with 100% intent. And that, in turn, that wakes up the, the real primal drivers. So if you haven't watched my first speech, it's all about that. It's all about that. I, I really believe it. So We still have a few more minutes. Does anybody else have another question? Um, being a beginner in this kind of thing, if I want to go down this road of um, martial arts or MMA, are there any particular systems you would recommend, or how would I start down this route? <clears throat> well, first of all, get clear on on what you want. As a, you know, for me, I'm a lifelong martial artist, so I'll do th I'll do some martial arts just because I want to um, 
you know, I'll do Tai Chi just to experience a different thing. And I know that it's not directly translated into the street, although you can push somebody and there's about 1% of Tai Chi that you can use in the street, but there's so many other benefits. So you have to get clear on what you want. If you say, okay, well, I want to be, you know, because some guys are martial artists and they're competitors, right? Some guys want, want the experience of getting in the cage. If you want that experience, you want to compete. Go to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for the, for the grappling, do competitions. If you want to get in the cage, do MMA. If you want um, to really get good at your kickboxing, do savat and do Thai boxing, right? Um, find a, a really good Jeet Kune Do instructor is going to have pretty much everything for you, right? They're, they're rare, but um, they're, they are out there. So a good Jeet Kune Do and a good Krav Maga instructor will have, um, you know, provided a school they, if they spar and they, they do. Sometimes it's really watered down. Uh, they'll they'll look at they'll take like two things from jujitsu and then they'll they'll add it and they'll go okay we're a complete art but they don't actually develop the, the ground fighting you've got to in every particular range look at that range and look at the arts that are sparring within that range right and if they can actually apply it then that's that's where you'll go to get that but you have to get clear on what you want and some guys they want to compete some guys are really you know they're lifelong martial arts but they're going to take a certain period and just focus on brazilian jiu-jitsu or a certain period where they're just going to focus on their striking you know or or their mma or even wrestling and judo so all those things combat arts sambo judo wrestling thai boxing savat boxing western boxing brazilian jiu-jitsu um, uh, catch as catch can wrestling shoot wrestling all those and if you get a good jkd guy he's going to have most of that stuff make sense any other questions guys all right let's give it up for ed Aiken. awesome guys thank you appreciate it